Good morning. Uh, I'm here. I'm here this morning to talk about uh, my experience as executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada, where I was uh, from January uh, 2011 until January 2013. And uh, but my history of the ACLU goes way back before then and continues to this day. In fact. So who knows anything about the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU? Anybody? Ring any bells at all? Uh, <laughs> uh, the ACLU uh, is headquartered in New York City. Uh, it has affiliates in every state in the United States. Uh, each state organization is called an affiliate. Uh, the state organizations get money from the national office, but they also are responsible for raising money on their own and uh, bringing in income in other ways. Uh, legally, they function separately. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we have the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Uh, it has its headquarters in Philadelphia. It has a uh, branch office in Harrisburg for lobbying the legislature. And it also has a branch office in Pittsburgh. In fact, the legal director, the person who handles all the litigation for the ACLU of Pennsylvania is actually in the Pittsburgh office, not in the Philadelphia office. His name is Vic Walchek. Uh, and he's, uh, he's quite an outstanding lawyer. Um, anyway, the uh, uh, ACLU was founded in 1920 uh, by, primarily by a guy, a guy by the name of Roger Baldwin. And uh, what was going on in 1920? Well, uh, World War I had just ended, World War I. And uh, in, during World War I, Congress and President Wilson had uh, passed uh, the uh, Alien uh, and Sedition Acts of 1917 uh, and a couple other laws that actually made it illegal to criticize the Army, to criticize the President, to criticize the Congress uh, while the war was going on. It, it act made it illegal to actually criticize the war itself. The fact that we were in, even in a war, it was illegal to criticize the fact that we were, we were in a war. Can you believe that? In, in the 20th century, it was illegal to criticize being in a war. So guess what? Uh, Roger Baldwin and several of the other founders of the ACLU had been thrown in prison simply for questioning or criticizing the war. And when the war was over, they founded an organization called the New York Civil Liberties Union. And oh, after a period, it became a national organization. The Nevada uh, ACLU was founded in the mid-1960s. So the ACLU did not spread all over the United States just overnight. Um, and it is the mission of the uh, ACLU, and always has been, to defend the constitutional rights of average Americans, uh, and not so average Americans. So um, one of the most famous cases the ACLU was ever involved in uh, was uh, in the late 1970s, uh, when uh, some neo-Nazis wanted to have a, a march in place called Skokie, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago that is heavily Jewish. And the uh, city of Skokie wanted to sort of shut that down, didn't want that to happen. And the ACLU uh, volunteered to defend the free speech rights and free assembly rights, those are both in the First Amendment, of neo-Nazis. Uh, the ACLU is a bit being headquartered in New York and attracting a, a lot of uh, you know, well-educated folks. Um, has, has always had uh, a, a significant uh, percentage of Jewish donors and Jewish members, particularly in the New York area. And of course, this decision to defend the neo-Nazis in Skokie was extremely controversial and cost the ACLU um, a lot of donations and a lot of members. But anyway, the ACLU is way past that. That was 40 years ago. Uh, and so uh, anyway, uh, many people think that the ACLU is, a, uh, is, a, is an anti-business organization. Um, this is actually completely incorrect. Uh, the ACLU actually does not involve itself in the business world at all. Uh, well, the ACLU is interested in protecting citizens uh, from the government, not from business. So the ACLU uh, is in the business of lobbying the government to change laws and also the ACLU is in the business of educating the public about the government and also is involved in suing the government. Uh, for example, threatening to sue the Skokie city government if they weren't going to allow the neo-Nazis to have their, uh, their, have their parade. So uh, anyway, typical defendants for the ACLU are, are school districts, city governments, county governments, state governments, and the federal government. Um, the ACLU, for years and years and years, 
uh, said, well, we have about a half a million members and donors around the United States, um, which is a lot, but it's not as big as, for example, the NRA, um, and uh, was r running on, on a budget of uh, in the tens of millions of dollars and also tens of millions of dollars in the bank and reserves. And uh, uh, the minute Donald Trump got elected in 2016, the number of members and donors to the ACLU just skyrocketed. Uh, the ACLU literally was getting more money than they knew what to do with. I mean, literally more money, tens of millions of dollars came to the ACLU and new contributions in the first year after Trump got elected uh, because uh, so many Americans were afraid that uh, the Trump administration was going to violate their constitutional rights and that the ACLU might not have enough money or have enough lawyers or both uh, to fight all the uh, uh, problems that they anticipated with the Trump administration. Has this ACLU sued the Trump administration a lot since, uh, since, uh, uh, since they were inaugurated? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, although uh, probably not as much as uh, some people anticipated or other people would like. Uh, I am a former journalist, uh, and I've spent basically my entire life either studying journalism, practicing journalism, or teaching journalism, or doing more than one of those things at a time. Uh, I've taught, for example, media law over the years, which is a First Amendment related topic. Uh, and, uh, and so um, I discovered the ACLU um, when I was still in high school, actually. I joined the ACLU when I was still in high school, and I've been a member of the ACLU continuously ever since, which is now coming up on, on almost 40 years now. Um, my interest was in the First Amendment area, but uh, it, it allowed me to uh, uh, learn a lot and, and think a lot about uh, other areas of constitutional law. I, I can tell you that over the years, I've not always agreed with the ACLU on every issue, but I've agreed with the ACLU on almost every issue, maybe 90, 95 uh, percent, which is a pretty good track record over uh, nearly 40 years, and also considering how many different issues the ACLU takes positions on. So um, uh, one of the things that I think is notable at this point about the ACLU is that in the early 1990s, the ACLU was the first national organization of any kind, of any stature at least, uh, to support uh, legalizing same-sex marriage in the United States. Uh, the ACLU was not a gay rights organization, uh, and in fact, uh, it had not been particularly active uh, in, in gay rights. Uh, but they basically said, like, okay, well, we're against discrimination, and we're against especially gender discrimination. We all should be against sexual orientation discrimination, and ergo, one plus one plus one equals three, and that means that we should legalize same-sex marriage. Uh, so, anyway, uh, what was going on with the gay rights organizations uh, in the early 1990s? Well, they, they actually were scared of the this, of this same-sex marriage issue. They were said, like, let's work on little stuff, let's work on minor issues. Let's, let's sort of make sure that openly gay people can be public school teachers, that they can adopt children. Maybe we'll think about, uh, you know, gay people being able to openly serve in the military. And then that, uh, that actually got squashed uh, when uh, President Clinton and Congress decided on the don't ask, don't tell policy, uh, which said, no, gay people still can't be open in the military. You can be gay in the military, but you just can't tell anyone, uh, which was what the policy was in the, uh, the United States for what, about 25 years uh, after that? So um, anyway, uh, the, the, that, that was sort of a notable <coughs> thing in hindsight for the ACLU was being out ahead of the gay rights groups. Uh, anyway, in uh, 2010, uh, eight years ago, uh, a little bit uh, le less than eight years ago, I was teaching at a university in uh, Pittsburgh, Point Park University. And uh, I was on a panel discussion at a summer conference of journalism professors, uh, the uh, AEJMC, which is the main U.S. organization for journalism professors. I was on a panel discussion called um, first, something like First Amendment in Crisis? Uh, and um, my role on the panel was to um, listen to whatever one of the other panelists said, the one in particular, uh, former uh, Governor Ritter of Colorado, and basically respond on my feet uh, to whatever Governor Ritter say, had to say about the First Amendment. And we had no idea what Governor Ritter was going to say about the First Amendment, and I was supposed to 
give a reaction response just immediately based on what he said, even though he didn't know what he was going to say. Well, I did that, and then a couple weeks later, I got an email from a media law professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and sort of said, um, do you happen to know anybody who might be interested in being executive director of the ACLU of Nevada? Which I knew was his very subtle way of suggesting that maybe I applied for the job. So um, I thought about it long and hard about leaving higher education, and I thought, well, maybe this will be temporary, maybe this will be permanent. Uh, and I applied for the job, the, the vetting process, the application process, by the way, went on forever. It was like, it was like trying to get a, uh, a security clearance for the White House uh, Chief of Staff or something. Um, and finally I got hired, I moved out to Las Vegas and, and started working there. So when I got there, the um, one thing was already uh, in, in motion, that well, two things were already in motion that were relevant to my remarks this morning. One was that the ACLU of Nevada was about to release a report that it had been working on for about a year on prison conditions uh, in Nevada. Um, and this came out uh, a couple of months after I got there. It was called a, a Not Fit for Human Habitation. Uh, has a subtitle like um, Nevada's Prisons in Crisis or something like that. And talked about the um, uh, just the medical care, the dental care, the mental health care, uh, the uh, uh, whether the food was sanitary or not, uh, and a variety of other issues. And it was a very blistering negative report on the Nevada prison system. I didn't have much uh, enroll in that. It was actually all written and already edited and so on by the time I got there. But it certainly put prisons and jails in right on my agenda right away as the new executive director um, of the ACLU of Nevada. The second thing that was already going on when I got there was that the uh, local ACLU and the national ACLU had filed a lawsuit against uh, Eli State Prison, which is one of the prisons in Nevada, state prisons in Nevada for inadequate medical care. Uh, several years earlier, and the ACLU had won the case. And as part of the settlement in the case, uh, the uh, ACLU of Nevada um, was supposed to send a representative along with a national representative and an impartial, mutually selected medical expert to go to the Eli State Prison uh, twice a year for, for two years, or maybe it was three, but I mean, at least two years, and actually do sort of a, do a spot check on medical care uh, in the Eli State Prison. So that was already uh, in place also when I got there and um, sort of gave me a heads up that maybe uh, not all was um, kosher, or not, and that, actually that word is operative for a little bit later, not all was kosher in the Nevada State Prisons. So um, anyway, um, the, uh, I'm just going to sort of take you through a timeline, and there's a point, point to all this. Um, in uh, one of one of the, the sort of uh, themes, I guess this morning is uh, is uh, is this uh, mismanagement of state prisons and how the Nevada sort of finally got it right uh, eventually, and those are closely uh, tied to making reforms to. Uh, modernize the Nevada State Prison and bring Nevada State Prisons up to national best practices standards. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, and there's a few other things going on here. Uh, uh, this is a continuing theme, how Nevada was going to handle uh, the death penalty. The death penalty is still legal uh, in Nevada. Uh, when I got there, the uh, the death chamber, they already called it, uh, was actually had been condemned. Um, no, sorry, the, uh, uh, the prison that the death chamber was in had been condemned and was slated to be closed. And so Nevada had this weird situation where, where there's the only place they could hold executions in the state of Nevada was in a room in a building that the entire rest of the building was, clo was closed. The entire rest of the building was empty and essentially been condemned, and yet there was this, this run room still, uh, still being kept open in the closed building for executions. And, and, and um, so we'll, let's talk about executions. Uh, in, in February 2011, a month after I got there, there were 82 prisoners on death row in Nevada, and so it sounds like, wow, maybe Nevada uh, executes a lot of people, or maybe Nevada can sentence a lot of people to death. Uh, actually, uh, neither, uh, as is true in a lot of other states. Um, there, there had been sort of a slow trickle of people sentenced to death. 
uh, and uh, there had been sort of endless appeals. Um, and I'm going, no, I don't want to use that term derogatorily. I, I support death penalty appeals. Um, but they do seem to go on forever. And there had only been 11 executions uh, since 1976. So if you do the math on that, that's like, um, what is that, uh, 30, 30, 35 years uh, with, only, uh, with only 11 executions, right? So a lot of people have been sitting on death row for a long time. And the fact was Nevada wasn't sentencing very many people to death penalty. Uh, anyway, uh, so in March we put out the report uh, that had been worked on before I got there. Uh, what were our recommendations? Well, um, community-based treatment uh, of uh, particularly uh, 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 people committed crimes while they were drug abusers or drug addicts. Uh, secondly, reclassifying uh, of B felonies, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Better medical care, well, we already saw that. Uh, and ending, ending the shackling of pregnant inmates, uh, which also would turn out to be a major issue um, over the coming uh, years. And then finally, creating an ombudsman for the prison system. So not for employees or for the public, but so that prisoners had some place to uh, complain directly about prison conditions. At the ACLU, um, we, the overwhelming majority of the mail we received every single day, every single week, all year, was from, from jail inmates and, and prisoners. We received dozens of letters in the, in the, by snail mail every day uh, from, from prisoners and inmates around the state uh, complaining about this, that, or the other thing. And of course, our capacity was very limited. We, we, we were not in capacity to investigate all of these letters we received, and we were certainly were not in a position to be filing you know, another lawsuit against the state prison system you know, every day of the week either. Um, anyway, what's reclassifying B felonies? Well, <clears throat> um, in Nevada, like pretty much every other state in the country, um, has, has had a legislature that has basically said like, Oh, uh, this kind of burglary is a, a class C felony, and you get uh, three to five years in prison if you get convicted of it. And but we still have lots and lots of burglaries in Nevada, so let's make that kind of burglary a class B felony, so we can send these guys away for five to ten years. And um, basically, um, they had done this continuously over a long period of time, and so lots and lots of crimes were resulting in, in pretty long prison sentences. Um, Nevada was to the point um, that 17% um, of all the prisoners in the state were over the age of 50, which was the sixth highest percentage in the United States. So uh, Nevada was sending a lot of people away for a long time, and the way to fix that was, was, was to, um, was to uh, first of all, uh, lessen the sentences on some of these uh, nonviolent crimes, and secondly was to figure out a way to maybe get uh, some of the folks out of prison who were, for example, in their 70s and 80s and still sitting, sitting in prison. So we worked on that too. Okay, uh, in March 2011, the legislature was in session. Uh, we and others supported that ombudsman who threw a bill in the legislature. Uh, guess what, it failed. Uh, the legislature was still uh, controlled by, by Republicans, by slim majorities, and they didn't want to be perceived as being soft on crime. Uh, also that month, in March 2011, we filed an amicus brief. Have you guys talked about amicus briefs? No. Okay. Uh, amicus briefs are basically um, arguments submitted in paper uh, where you're supporting someone else's lawsuit. And, uh, you actually have to ask a court permission, can we file an amicus brief to support their lawsuit? And a, and a court can either say yes or no. Uh, they usually say yes, but not always. Um, particularly to organizations like the ACLU. Anyway, in this case, uh, John, a guy named John Snow um, had, was, had been in prison for quite a long while and he had a debilitating hip injury. Uh, and he had kept on asking uh, the prison system in, in, in Nevada, I need, I need surgery, I need surgery, I need surgery. And they kept on saying, no, 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 no. And he was actually to the point where he could not walk anymore. He was literally, try, literally having to drag himself down the hallway to get from his cell to a shower or to get from his cell to a dining room or whatever, right? Or, 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 a, or a, you know, an outside exercise area, right? He was literally dragging himself down the floor. So. Um, we, um, he was suing the Nevada prison system. We supported that uh, with our amicus brief. 
and um, we found out, you know, it was the word sort of got out that, at that point that that um, you know the prison system was complaining about how much they were spending on medical care for older prisoners like Mr. Snow. The average uh, medical care cost for prisoners between the ages of 60 and 65 was four thousand dollars per year, uh, and for say uh, uh, prisoners between the ages of 20 and 30 it was like one thousand dollars a year. Right, so another uh, you can see why. Uh, Nevada prison system didn't want to spend money on older prisoners unless they had to. They already felt they were spending a lot, uh, and yet, uh, you know, our argument that in, their, in our amicus brief and the other in the original uh, case was that they were violating his constitutional rights. So, <clears throat> anyway, you know, March 2011, we were also supporting a bill in the legislature that would have made it possible for uh, ex felons in Nevada to get the right to vote. Uh, felons are de disenfranchised, they lose their right to vote, and in two, early 2011 there were 43,500 Nevadans who uh, could not vote because of a, a felony conviction. On top of that, uh, the law on how you could apply to, to, to vote again was, was vague, was kind of confusing. Um, so many prisoners, you know, their first language was not English, or they had a low education level, or you know, some other issue that sort of uh, they, they didn't have access to legal advice or whatever on that. And um, Nevada had a real, real great catch-22. They had a had a vague law, vague and confusing law on how you can get your right to vote back, and they had a separate law that says if you apply to vote again when you're a felon, a felon and you're not eligible to vote again, that itself is a new felony. So people could just be trying to be good citizens, trying to get their voting rights back after they got out of prison, and they might not be eligible yet for some reason, and they would commit a new felony by simply trying to get their vote, right to vote back when they weren't quite eligible yet for some reason. So we were trying to get that changed too. Also in that session of the legislature, uh, we were trying to get a bill passed that would fund a study on how much death penalty was costing in Nevada. There's a lot of data, a lot of arguments around the country about does it cost more to, for example, have a death penalty uh, conviction and then end, lots and lots of appeals and then perhaps an execution someday, <coughs> or does it cost more to keep someone in prison for life? Um, and uh, a lot of the public thinks the execution is actually cheaper and faster than keeping someone in, in prison for life, but the appeals costs are, are tremendous. And actually, um, the, uh, um, the death penalty appeals and an execution actually end up costing more than keeping someone in prison for life on average, uh, which is you know just boggles the mind of the general person of the average person, the general public. Anyway, uh, in May 2011, uh, the governor of Nevada, he's still there, so Brian Sandoval, uh, he did sign a bill that prohibited the shackling of pregnant prisoners uh, during childbirth. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a little, we in a little bit. So that was a win uh, in a pretty disappointing legislative session for us uh, overall. In mid-2011, uh, this was also a continuing theme, uh, a, an Orthodox Jewish prisoner uh, sued the state of Nevada saying that he was not getting um, certified kosher meals uh, served to him in the prison system. Um, and this also, there was also several other cases like this in Nevada while we were there. So um, what is that all about? Well, you know, um, we have a lot of court decisions and, and that say that prisoners should be able to uh, freely exercise their religion while they're in, in prisons and jails in the United States. Um, and that basically if they have a dietary restriction, such as being, say, Jewish or Muslim or, or some other faiths too, that the prison has, has to accommodate the, um, the practice of their religion through the special diet. So um, a lot of people who work in prison systems in the United States um, just sort of like can't believe that they have to give prisoners the kind of food that they want. Uh, and this is a constant source of lit litigation around the United States where prisons are refusing to give halal meals to Muslim prisoners or refusing to give kosher meals to Jewish prisoners. And then the prison system ends up getting sued and the prison system always loses. Let me repeat that, always loses. So. Uh, what, was also, what was also going on in Nevada with this? Prison officials told me and told lots of other people that they were pretty, pretty convinced, in fact, they just sort of thought they knew for a fact, that there were non-Jewish and non-Muslim prisoners 
requesting uh, halal or kosher meals uh, because of the fact that the food quality was higher. And sort of everybody, everybody knew that the kosher and halal meals were, uh, there were a, le a much smaller number of them prepared. They were specially prepared. They were, they were not mass produced like the meals that the other prisoners were, were eating. And that any prisoner, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or not, would prefer probably a halal or kosher meal over the usual food. So Nevada put in, 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 in place um, this rather onerous questionnaire that went, went on for about four pages, or uh, three, three or four pages of questions where they were asking prisoners who were requesting a halal or kosher meal to prove to the prison, prison system that they were Jewish, or to prove to the prison system that they were Muslim. Now, think about this for a second. Would you like that? Would you like to, you know, you say maybe you're Lutheran and you're a teal, would you like to have to prove to the government that you really are Lutheran, right? And how would you do that exactly, right? Well, fortunately, the easy answer to that is in the United States, because also because of the First Amendment, the freedom of religion uh, question, uh, clause and also the separation of church and state clause in the First Amendment, Americans do not have to prove to the government that they are or are not Jewish, or are, are not Muslim, or are, are not Christian, or are, are not atheist, for example, right? And so um, this was about to get heated up when I left the ACLU a couple of years later, uh, was trying to get rid of this questionnaire that was basically quizzing Americans to, on pr proving their, their religious beliefs. Would, this re would getting rid of that questionnaire result in a lot of non-Jewish and non-Muslim prisoners getting those special meals? Yes. But um, that's the price we pay for respecting the First Amendment rights of religious Americans and not having tests or quizzes coming from the government to prove what your religion, religion is or what your religious beliefs are. That's a blatantly unconstitutional practice. Anyway, um, also that month, in June 2011, we, uh, the ACLU of Nevada, we sent a letter to the Nevada prison system uh, basically saying, you guys are completely blowing it on transgender prisoners. You don't have uh, medical care for transgender prisoners. You don't have mental health care for transgender prisoners. You're blowing it on, on the transgender prisoners who are taking, uh, uh, taking hormones for a, a gender transition. You uh, are refusing to uh, even think about per, uh, paying for sex reassignment surgery. Um, and uh, yeah, on and on, right? And so this was also kind of an ongoing theme was getting Nevada up, to, up into the uh, 21st century on transgender rights. Um, also that month in July 2011, I was, this, I was there during all of this, um, we also um, uh, sent a, uh, a rather demanding letter to um, 11 different county jails in Nevada um, saying that their um, policy about prisoner inmate mail was unconstitutional. What were those 11 counties doing? <laughs> By the way, Nevada only has like 24 counties, so it was half the state. Um, they had policies that said inmates could only receive postcards through the mail. No letters, no enclosed cards like birthday cards or Christmas cards or whatever. No books, no magazines. All you could get when you're in jail is a postcard. And anyone can read it. Well, we pointed out to the, those county jails that that was also unconstitutional under all kinds of various uh, state and federal court decisions. Anyway, that same month, also July 2011, uh, the news came out that there had been a, a bunch of errors in the uh, Clark County uh, forensics lab. Uh, Clark County is where Las Vegas is. Um, and um, it was um, immediately <coughs> discovered that uh, two samples had been switched in 2001, uh, resulting in a guilty man going free and an innocent, innocent man, man spending four years in jail or prison for no reason. So how'd they make the switch? Well, you know, it was stupid and labs aren't supposed to do that. I'm not going to defend it, uh, but uh, I can tell you, in that, in that particular case, uh, the two men were cousins. Um, so they had, you know, what's, what's, I think, the same last names and um, uh, similar genetic profiles and so on and so forth. 
but it was still a botch, and um, a man was in prison for no reason for four years, uh, and it, it result what was later discovered was that it was not the only mistake uh, that had been made in the, in the crime lab. Also in July 2011, we re released a report that uh, explained in great detail about how Nevada was not getting prisoners ready for parole. Uh, and uh, basically, they were sort of, uh, uh, you know, having to uh, get out of prison and, and figure out on their own how to get to a halfway house and figure out on their own how to apply for a job and, and, and again, figure out on their own uh, how, to, how and when to get their voting rights back and on and on and on. And uh, in subsequent years, they actually, there was some, some fixes to this problem, too. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, in 2011, it emerged that there was a case going on in which a, a prisoner in Nevada had sued uh, the state, uh, demanding that the, the state um, uh, pay for sex reassignment surgery for, for, for this person, a, a transgender prisoner. Um, and, and courts were beginning to seem somewhat sympathetic to this. Um, in 2011, uh, Nevada, the, the, there was new uh, uh, regs passed to pr supposedly protect women prisoners, uh, but um, we'll see as we'll see in a minute. They didn't they didn't really work very well. In January 2012, um, the oldest prison in the state, the Nevada State Prison, uh, finally closed. Um, and to give you some idea of how long Nevada had been running this prison. Uh, it, it, the, the first idea about what to do with the prison was, when it was closed, was turn it into a museum. The prison had been open for 150 years, parts of it. So, anybody been to the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, which is also now a museum? Okay, same deal. We, we here in Pennsylvania, we also had a prison that was started in about 1820 and wasn't closed until 1971. If you go see this place, you in the mind boggles that this was still a Pennsylvania State prison in the 1970s. It's We're like going to be touring the Ohio State Reformatory um, on April 5th. Okay, which is also a very long. Um, it closed even more recently than Eastern State did, but it was opened later. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, then you guys will see. It's horrible. Have you been to Eastern State? I haven't. Okay. <clears throat> well, I recommend it. I almost so. did, but you know, long story. Didn't quite make it. Okay. Um, so anyway, in February 2012, a federal judge uh, uh, ruled that uh, uh, Muslim and, and Jewish prisoners could not be served a so-called common fair meal. Uh, that the prison system was saying was fine for everybody because it was not <coughs> kosher certified, uh, and then we'll get some more cases along these lines later. Uh, in February 2012, inmates won a civil rights case from 2004, it had been languishing for eight years, um, be over the fact that two prison, two jail guards at the Clark County Detention Center had thought it was hilarious to throw two lit firecrackers into a jail cell with two prisoners inside two inmates inside. So they sued, they won. Uh, in June 2012, uh, the National ACLU uh, released uh, its, its report on, on, on prisoners over the age of 50. Uh, this gave us some impetus to talk again about Nevada having 17% of its prisoners over the age of 50. At the time, um, uh, I, there was, we presented a press release about this, and, and, uh, and I, as executive director of the ACLU, uh, said, like, Nevada likes to brag that it has a, a model program for L older prisoners, because guess what, it, and that's great, because guess what, it needs it. So, in July 2012, um, so at this point it's been, been there a year and a half, uh, the uh, Nevada Department of Corrections started asking for money for a new death chamber uh, to um, move, have it somewhere other than the closed building, to build a new one somewhere else. And um, they said, oh, it's okay, it's fine, it'll only cost $385,000 to build that room. Uh, I don't know if that bo makes your mind boggle or not, but it sort of makes my mind boggle. It costs $385,000 for one room. But you just wait. Um, <coughs> So anyway, um, in September 2012, the uh, state public defender uh, asked us, to, asked the ACLU to help them uh, challenge the anti-sodomy law. 
uh, and basically in 2000, September 2012, it was uh, still illegal under state law for uh, gay, or, gay and lesbian people to have sex. Um, and we said, yeah, well, that needs to go. And about this time, um, and I don't remember exactly the date, I wasn't able to look it up, but um, the, uh, um, we were increasingly working on, on jail and prisoner, prison issues, as you can tell, I've uh, you already mentioned a whole lot of them already. And um, uh, I decided that uh, I was going to have a meeting with the State Department of Corrections director, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Greg Cox. And um, Mr. Cox was, um, seemed like a fairly casual guy, uh, uh, maybe even, even kind of friendly. Uh, he didn't seem like a kind of a jerk or a, you know, a real tough guy or whatever. He seemed it was like he was kind of approachable and so on. And, and he and I had got talked here and there and now and then. And so I called him up and, and um, uh, or sent him an email or something. And I said, uh, uh, Greg, you know, I'd just like to come over to your office next time you're in Las Vegas he sort of moved around the state day to day doing his job and I just you know just want to have a casual a casual conversation off the record about a variety of issues and we just want to have some dialogue about some things and and uh, you know and uh, um, not you know uh, serious issues but not a you know not a big big deal kind of kind of conversation so he said fine fine so um, I made up a little laundry list of topics I wanted to talk about there's about five things on there and and they were a lot the same things as same some of these same things transgender prisoners medical care food and some of these other issues in the prison system and um, I thought that when I arrived at his office there in Las Vegas that, that you know I was just going to go into his, in his office and that he and I were going to sit there and have a nice pleasant chat we both take some notes and exchange some ideas and it'd be a very productive little conversation and when I got there, instead, I was led into a conference room, uh, and he, was, he, he took me in there, and the deputy uh, state corrections director was there, and his administrative assistant was there, and the assistant attorney general of Nevada for jails and prisons was also there. Um, so um, it was, instead of it being a, a two of us having a meeting, it turned out to be five of us having a meeting. Uh, <clears throat> And um, they were scared to death. I don't, you know, <laughs> I thought it was very funny actually, right? I just wanted to show up and have a casual conversation, and I think they were thinking that I was showing up to drop, you know, half a dozen lawsuits on their desk. Well, that told me a lot, right? Maybe they were scared to death because they had a lot, a lot to be scared about, and uh, maybe they were a little bit nervous about the ACLU because. We kept on winning our cases against them and just about everybody else. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, anyway, and everybody was taking notes, and this meeting was being recorded, and so on and so forth. I was going, "Oh, this is this is very interesting, isn't it?" So, so how does the ACLU do its work? Well, the ACLU doesn't just drop lawsuits on people's desk desks, right? normal modus operandi for like ACLU of Pennsylvania or the ACLU of Nevada is if there's something going on, for example, in the state prison system, the first thing we do is to try to just have a casual conversation about it and say, we're concerned about this. It looks like there's some constitutional law issues here. Uh, you might want to look into this with your lawyers, make sure that you're complying with state and federal laws and relevant court decisions. And then, you know, like, we'll get back to you like in six months or a year from now. And that's why we worked did things. And then uh, six months or a year later, we'd go back to the, whoever we were working with, the school district or a city government or the prison system and say, hey, we talked with you a year ago about this or that and the other thing. Uh, have you made any progress? What are you thinking? Have you got any plans to make some changes? And if they said like, no, then we'd, we'd say like, we'd sort of drop a hint like, well, this is something we could potentially litigate over. This is something that we're very concerned about, and it doesn't look like you're making much progress. So why don't you think more seriously about this issue? And then and we'll get back to you. And then like six months or a year later, we'd go come back to them and say, like, you've made any progress on this? And they go, like, no, not really. And we go, like, well, okay, 
um, you need to fix this in the next six months or we are definitely going to sue you. And then if they didn't fix it within six months, a rule or a procedure or whatever, then we'd sue them, right? So anytime the ACLU, I mean at least not, uh, not the national ACLU when they're doing emergency leg uh, legislation, <coughs> for example, immigration, the immigration executive order, but normal on a day-to-day -day basis, ACLU organizations around the country give people months and years to fix constitutional problems in school districts and city governments and county governments and prison systems and so on and so forth. When the ACLU sues, it's a last resort. Nobody wants to rush into court. Nobody wants to do litigation unless it's necessary. Litigation is expensive, it's tedious, it's stressful, it's time consuming, it's chancy. You don't know whether it's going to succeed or not, right? So, anyway, so that's how the ACLU runs things. And they don't, the ACLU just, doesn't just sue people on the drop of a hat. Anyway, uh, Finally, in late 2012, also, uh, there was a little more conversation about uh, giving more money to the State Division of Parole and Probation. Uh, this was, um, uh, this was you know, part of this problem of the state not getting prisoners ready for parole, um, and there was multiple problems with that. Um, uh, there were uh, prisoners who were still in prison for weeks or months after they had been paroled. Uh, because a, a plan, they had, didn't have an approved plan by the government of what they planned to do when they got, got out of prison. So let me, re let me repeat this. People who were not supposed to be in prison anymore <coughs> were being kept in prison for weeks and months just because they didn't have a <coughs> plan for what they planned to do when they got out of prison. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, okay, so the legislature started again in early February 2013, shortly after I left Nevada. Um, and uh, but this stuff, some of the stuff was in the works when I was there. The one of the one of the bills that the, the Nevada Department of Corrections was pushing in the 2013 legislature was a bill that they said was going to bring the Nevada State Prison uh, prison system into compliance with the uh, Federal <coughs> Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, I don't know if you t have you talked about that in this class. I haven't gotten to it yet. What's that? We have not gotten to it. Not yet. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll I'll let you you know, you know tell the students all the details about that later. But let's just say that Congress passed a law that was trying to um, uh, 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 pre prevent and punish uh, rapes ha handling in prison, and Nevada said, well, we're going to pass a state law so that we're in compliance with the federal law, uh, and yet. When we looked at the when we looked at the legislation, the ACLU of Nevada, it was basically went way overboard. It would have basically penalized prisoners uh, for, for example, one prisoner just simply kissing another. It was arguable that a it, it was arguable that the bill would have prohibited just one prisoner sort of romantically looking at another prisoner. And. We, the ACLU pointed out, like, no, that's not what the Rape Elimination Act was about. It was about forcible uh, contact. Uh, it was not about consensual contact or communication. Anyway, um, in the 2013 legislature, the INDOC, the mm -hmm. Nevada Department of Corrections, was still working on getting their money uh, for the death chamber. And uh, the legislature said, how much will it cost? And just two years later, they were saying, oh, sorry, it's really going to cost $700,000, not $385,000. Uh, $385, so um, how did the cost of a death chamber double in two years? Like, whoops, right? It's like, oh, our estimates were wrong, and costs have gone way up. And sorry, hope you don't mind the $700,000. So um, they they did pass it. The legislature did 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 pass the funding for the new death chamber, um, and it actually ended up um, costing even more than that. It ended up costing eight hundred sixty thousand dollars when it was all said and done. Uh, my guess is that probably some people are getting really rich under the table on that deal, but um, that sounds like you know that would not be unusual in Nevada. 
In July 2013, um, again, this was at the end of the legislative session, um, and I wasn't there anymore, but um, we, this was being talked about when I left, the ACLU of Nevada filed a um, lawsuit uh, on behalf, with some other organizations, on behalf of a publication called Prison Legal News, uh, which is a national publication about what's going on, literally what's going on in, in, in laws affecting uh, jails and prisons in the United States. Um, and what was weird about this was we, there were multiple prisons in, in Nevada that were prohibiting prisoners from receiving this in the mail on the, ba on, the uh, on the argument that it was not on the approved list of publications for prisoners to receive. Um, so basically the Nevada prisons were preventing prisoners from learning more information about their own legal rights, about their own development, their legal, legal developments around the country that might uh, affect their situation in prison in Nevada. But even weirder than that was that 15 years earlier, the ACLU of Nevada had filed another lawsuit on behalf of prison legal news for the exact same reason exact same reason 15 years earlier and as litigation went along it became obvious that even though the 15 year earlier litigation had been very expensive for the state of Nevada that they had never implemented mail policies for prisoners that implemented the settlement from that case so let me repeat that the state of Nevada had gone on for 15 years not implementing what they were required to implement as a settlement from a lawsuit. And then they ended up getting sued for the same thing all over again. Hello? Okay. Well, guess what else happened? Another like, whoops. Uh, right after State of Nevada passed both laws and policies saying that Prison, that women prisoners could not be shackled during childbirth or in the moment, in the minutes immediately leading up to childbirth, guess what? A woman prisoner got shackled on her way to being given childbirth and right, literally right up to the second that she was giving birth. So a brand new law that had gotten a lot of publicity was immediately violated. And there was no argument about it. They admitted that they violated it. So, sloppy, sloppy. Anyway, and how much, by the way, did, did she get from the state of Nevada? 130,000. How much did Prison Legal News get in a settlement from the state of Nevada? Roughly half a million. So, you know, guess what? Laws can, states can save a lot of money if they'll just follow their own laws. So, speaking of which, in October 2013, um, it, um, a report came out that, that um, illegal delays in transferring uh, inmates from uh, Clark, Clark County Detention Center in Las Vegas to state prisons after they'd been convicted and sentenced to state prison, but just the delays and transfers were costing Clark County, just Clark County, $17 million per year. In other words, they were stuck with prisoners that didn't belong there anymore because the state government was being slow in, in accepting them. The transfers were not happening long enough, fast enough, and Clark County taxpayers in Las Vegas were picking up the tab to the tune of $17 million a year for the slow state prison system. Okay, so in um, October 2013, the Nevada State Prison System says, ta-da, we finally have enough space for all the prisoners in, the, in Nevada, right? We're not overflowing, we're not overcrowded, and everything seems to be like going great. Uh, at that time, they also uh, were uh, announcing that the uh, total population of the prison was 
prisons in Nevada was 12,700 prisoners. Uh, the total cost of the prison system was $275 million a year. And the, therefore, the average prisoner um, was costing the state $20,000 per year. We'll come back to that number a little bit later, too. Anyway, as 2013 wrapped up, they were Nevada prison system was bragging about how they were spending uh, basically very, very little on medical care for the prisoners. They were bragging about that, um, which would come back to bite them, too. Uh, and also, in late November, the, uh, there was a national report that came out about how many uh, prisoners in the United States were in, in, had life in prison sentences for nonviolent offenses. Let me repeat that, life sentences for nonviolent offenses. And the num national number was 3,278, at least, in late no no November, in November 2013. So the Nevada ACLU asked the state prison system in Nevada, how many of these 3,278 uh, nonviolent life sentence prisoners are here in Nevada? And Nevada said, we're not going to tell you. We know, but we're not going to tell you. Wow, love that transparency. Um, also that month, um, the Nevada, Las Vegas Review Journal, which is a major metropolitan daily newspaper in Nevada, um, released an investigative, uh, you know, big story that they had done on uh, psychiatric care uh, in the Nevada state prison system, and found out that there's only 66 beds in the whole state uh, for uh, psychiatric uh, care for maximum security prisoners. Which brings me to this. How many prisoners did I say was, were in Nevada? Well, uh, 12,700. <coughs> you know what people said about prisoners in Nevada when I was there? It was a joke. It was a sick joke. The joke was, what is the, what is the largest psychological and psychiatric care facility in Nevada? And the answer was the state prison system. What were experts' estimates about the, what percentage of prisoners in a state like Nevada, a typical state like Nevada, were mentally ill? Mm, roughly 40%. Experts say roughly 40% of prisoners in state prisons in the United States are mentally ill. 40%. What's 40% of? 2,700. Well, I can't do the math that quick in my head, but let's just say it's a lot more than 66. And not all mentally ill prisoners are maximum security prisoners, but anyway, it's still a big problem. And psychiatric care in the, in the, was pretty much crappy for everyone in the state prison system. So uh, anyway, there was uh, some, some good news, I guess. In December 2013, uh, Nevada De Department of Corrections announced that they were um, dropping the $1 upfront fee for prisoners to use the telephones in the prisons. Uh, but they still said they were going to keep the 12 cents a minute for local calls, 13 cents a minute for domestic long distance, and $3.50 fee plus 79 cents per minute for international calls. You might say, well, how many international calls did Nevada prisoners have to make? Well, actually a bunch, uh, because um, Nevada's got a bunch of prisoners from Mexico and Latin America in the state prison system. One of the organizations I also worked with when I was in Nevada was the Mexican Consulate. And the, they had a uh, legal counsel of Mexican Consulate, right, worked with regularly a guy named Octavio uh, Perales. And uh, one of his jobs was actually going and in, in frequently visiting Mexican prisoners in the, in the state prison system and making sure that, both, uh, that they were both uh, being treated well under state and federal laws, but also under international law. 
Here's an interesting wrinkle. Americans don't usually think about the fact that uh, foreigners who are in American prisons um, are also covered by international law. And that was part of his job. Okay, um, in 2014, the NDOC got hit with another lawsuit over food. This time it was a, a prisoner who pra said he practiced Satanism. And, uh, and his case actually also went well. Um, in, also in, in mid summer 2014, uh, the news got out that um, even though the average prisoner was costing Nevada 2, 000, only $20,000 a year, It was estimated that Nevada's most famous prisoner, a guy by the name of O.J. Simpson, was costing Nevada 225,000 $225, per year. Sorry, left out that five. $225,000 a year for Nevada's celebrity prisoner, Mr. O.J. Simpson. He's out, by the way, now. He's apparently hanging around Las Vegas playing lots of golf. <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, um, in late 2014, the Nevada Department of Corrections got a lot of publicity for uh, handcuffing and hog-tying juvenile prisoners, 14, 16-year-old kids in juvenile facilities being uh, handcuffed behind their back and having their feet shackled and being left on the floor in a room for several hours at a time. Guess what? They also sued and they also won. In late 2014, uh, another lawsuit that was going on uh, involved a prisoner who had, was, um, was sued the state because uh, he, they would not give him cataract surgery on his eyes. Um, and the argument for the, from the Department of Corrections was, well, you only have, you're, you only have cataracts, cataracts in one of your eyes, the other one works just fine, so we don't care. As long as you have one working eye, um, we don't care. So guess what, he also won. Uh, in late, near the end of 2014, um, and we're getting sort of to, um, to uh, you know, some major changes coming up. In late 2014, at the High Desert State Prison, uh, there were uh, a, a handcuffed prisoners who got shot by guards. Let me repeat that, handcuffed prisoners who were shot by guards. Um, they also sued, and they also won, but it was worse than that. Um, Nevada Department of Corrections uh, claimed that, uh, they, uh, that they were completely open, that uh, multiple agencies had been found out about it, that, that it would not have been difficult for the public or the media to find out about it, and yet basically nobody in Nevada knew for four months that, that handcuffed prisoners had been shot at the High Desert State Prison. So there were questions about cover-up, and uh, also questions about um, what, um, you know, what was going on with the state prison director, Mr. Greg Cox. Um, and January 2015, state prison system all of a sudden says like, oh my god, we also need 100 staff members. And they were going, well, where the heck did that come from? We thought everything was working fine. <clears throat> and then you say, well, you need 100 staff members immediately. They're going to cost $7.5 million. So anyway, what happened in, um, so in early 2015, We had an, there was another legislative session in Nevada. The legislature in Nevada uh, just uh, b basically meets the first five, five or six months of odd-numbered years. Unlike Pennsylvania, which has the country's largest full-time year-round legislature. Nevada says, like, no, we consider our legislators to be part-timers and not just, you know, basically, we need them full-time about six months every two years. Well, in 2014, um, uh, there was a wave of Republican victories, um, and uh, uh, they completely smashed the Democrats in 2014. 
got a, got good majorities in both houses of the state legislature, and they basically started pa proposing a lot more bills on guess what, increasing sentences, being tough on crime, yada yada. Uh, and um, twenty, dis despite the fact that probably needed to lessen some of the sentences in Nevada. Uh, 27 new bills that were, were passed in the legislature that year that would have either created new crimes that didn't exist or would have increased the sentences for existing crimes. Well, that was not, not, not going in the right direction. Anyway, um, uh, in May 2015, also from High, High Desert State Prison, uh, word got out that um, while well, inmates sued, the, a prisoner sued the, the prison uh, because um, he had been um, uh, uh, crying out for weeks and perhaps months that his, his that he his, he needed dental work, that his his teeth were for hurting him. He was in severe pain, and they just ignored him. They just ignored him day after day and week after week after week. And the prisoner ended up pulling out his own teeth to end the pain. Well, guess what? He ended up suing the state prison system uh, for not giving him dental care, and he also won that case, as well as $60,000. Anyway, in mid-2015, Greg Cox, the director of the prison system, basically says, like, whoa, we, we do have a problem with guards shooting uh, prisoners. Um, and uh, some, of them have, some of them have been seriously injured, a few of them have been killed, and it's because we've been using bird shot uh, in, the, in the guns in the prisons. And Cox said, like, maybe we need to start using rubber bullets in, instead of the bird shot. Like, well, hey, Greg, maybe you think, huh? Uh, anyway, uh, uh, there was more incidents in the state prisons, a high desert state prison in July, and, and three more prisoners shot at the Lovelock Correctional Center, also in July. Um, and um, but by that time, people in Nevada are sort of going, what is going on in the state prisons? Why do prisoners keep on getting shot regularly, particularly at high desert state prison? So the governor uh, and the, Mr. Cox decided to have an outside review uh, of the use of force, the use of violence against prisoners in the prison system and, uh, and contracted to an outside organization, the Association of State Correctional Administrators, to do the study. And it, they set a fee and they set a deadline. And Mr. Cox was supposed to uh, cooperate with that organization in getting the report done. Uh, well, the report was supposed to be done in September of 2015 and it missed the deadline. Governor Sandoval, who, as I said, by the way, is still governor, at least for another few months until early January 2019. Mr. Sandoval was very mad about this. And he used it as a, an opportunity to, guess what? Fire Greg Cox. You're out. But when the governor was asked, like, did you really fire him? just because the report was late? I mean, he wasn't even the one writing the report. It was this association that was writing, writing the report. You were just, you know, Cox was just cooperating with that association writing the report. And Governor Sandoval says, no, you're right. There were lots of reasons why I fired Greg Cox. Well, maybe you all can see that, right? <laughs> there were lots of problems in the prison system. Lots of lawsuits over food and violence and uh, medical care, dental care, First Amendment rights of, res of getting magazines, all kinds of stuff going on. Handcuffing juveniles. So, um, guess what happened after that? All of a sudden things started changing. After when Cox got fired, things started changing. Um, first thing that happened was Nevada started um, uh, and cutting back on its backlog, cutting back on its backlog of parole applications and parole processes. All of a sudden, people were up for parole a lot faster, and they were getting parole faster. And when they were getting parole, they were getting released from prisons faster. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but it was kind of interesting how that happened. Started happening right after Cox got fired. Uh, 
The, and also, uh, the state uh, opened, a, opened a dormitory style building for parolees. Uh, the uh, Clark County District Attorney's Office started a, a corrections review unit. In other words, basically going back and looking at old cases and making, maybe making sure that there weren't any wrongful convictions. Uh, the Nevada Supreme Court limited life sentences for juveniles, uh, finally, in early 2016. Also that month, Nevada settled the prison legal news censorship case, which I mentioned earlier. And also that month in January 2016, uh, the new the, the Nevada Department of Corrections announced we definitely are not going to be using birdshot anymore uh, in, in, in guards' rifles. We're only going to be using rubber bullets for sure, and we're going to try to emphasize just using pepper spray and batons and try to limit the use of, of guns entirely uh, with the prisoners. So uh, a couple months later, a, a, new, uh, a new prison director was uh, hired. Um, and his name was James, sorry. James Zurenza, and he was from the East Coast. He was not from Nevada. He, basically came in, he had outside eyes, he had experience outside the state. Uh, Cox had been, had, been, had been working in Nevada for quite a while, even before he became director. He was kind of captive of the, of the uh, culture there in Nevada and the, and the unions and so on there in the prison system. And uh, Zurinda comes in and says like, okay, we're gonna change things um, <clears throat> quite a bit around here. So uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a, uh, a lawsuit going on about a pagan worship area that had been destroyed that was uh, a First Amendment problem. Another prisoner suing over uh, needing a special diet. Uh, and all these things were you know, going on. Well, anyway, Zorinda comes along and says, uh, we're going to prohibit the use of birdshot in, in, in guns and prisons. I'm going to focus on inmate rehabilitation. Uh, we're going to fix the way that we uh, treat HIV positive prisoners. We're going to end discrimination against prisoners who have disabilities. And we're just going to like basically modernize and update the whole prison system. So, how are we doing on time? Uh, about five minutes. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, I just want to sort of end, the, end it on a high note. I mean, things that uh, Mr. Zorinda is still director of prisons. Uh, several years later, the state has made um, you know great progress uh, under his leadership. Uh, basically, it became more and more obvious in hindsight uh, that um, that you know things were that, J that Greg Cox. Did, didn't do a very good job as uh, a director of the, of the prison system for whatever reasons. Um, and um, you know that maybe things are going in the right direction uh, in Nevada, particularly with probation and parole, medical care, uh, dental care, and prisoners' First Amendment rights, as well as not, not quite shooting them so often. Anyway, that's the story. Okay, well, if you ever want to talk about any of this, I'd be glad to uh, talk about any of this in more detail. Uh, if, you, um, uh, if you want to talk with me about the ACLU, that's great too. Also, there's lots of information on, online about, um, there's an ACLU Nevada website. Uh, of course, there's a lot of the stuff is covered by the media in Nevada that's available online. Um, and um, I'll just, you know, uh, you know, I know Nevada's probably a little bit out of your, uh, out of your a, a bailiwick or whatever, but uh, and, I, and there's a whole other story going on in Pennsylvania, but Nevada is a, a good story, and, and we can be objective about it and, uh, from and from having a little bit of uh, distance from it. So thanks thanks a lot for having me this morning.